Attention all personnel. Incoming podcast. This is MASH Matters. Hello, hello, hello. We are back with another episode of MASH Matters, celebrating the greatest television show of all time, starring Jeff Maxwell, who was on one of the greatest shows of all time, MASH. Hello, Mr. Maxwell. How are you, sir? I'm very fine, uh, Mr. Patrick, sir, and I, I'm hoping you are well as well, because <laughs> this is certainly a time to try and be as well as one can be expected to be. Yes. Because otherwise, you're in a lot of trouble if you're not well. <laughs> now, if you are listening to this episode well into the future, we are actually releasing this episode in the middle of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic that is now worldwide. And so mm-hmm. before we jump into our interview with our very special guest, uh, I thought we'd just take a moment and do a little wellness check for both of us and, and our listeners and see how everybody's doing. Jeff, how are you doing during this crisis? Let me stick my tongue out and you can look at my throat. Uh, Yeah, well, you know, I'm doing okay. Uh, I don't have any uh, symptoms of anything. Good. Any abnormal symptoms. I mean, I'm I'm normally uh, dizzy and tired and exhausted and run down. So I feel pretty good, actually. Good. I don't feel any different. I have no fevers. I've not done anything because there's nothing to do. I can't go anywhere. Right. I don't go to restaurants. I don't play golf, which is frustrating to me because I really love playing golf. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, my wife and I are pretty much bound up in our home. Uh, I have bound her up as well to a chair just so she doesn't run off and do anything crazy. (laughs) So we're both bound here. I bring her food. And so far, you know, we're just hanging in there. And and you. Well, everything's fine here. My wife and kids are home. This is the longest spring break they have ever had. It's never going to end. And, you know, I work from home. So it's been interesting, and you know, having them around. I'm used to having them around in the summertime because my wife is a teacher and my kids, you know, don't have school in the summer. But summer vacation came a lot sooner than I expected this year. And so, uh, you know, just trying to work through the craziness and uh, like everybody just waiting and and trying to do the next best thing and uh, take care of yourself and wash your hands and don't be high fiving strangers and, (laughs) you know, everything we're supposed to do to hopefully stop the spread of this uh, of this nastiness out there. You know, my daughter, she never wants to leave the house anytime anyway. So this is a dream come true for her. And (laughs) and, uh, I'm an introvert. So, you you know, I've been kind of preparing for this for my whole life as well. So we're doing fine. Knock on wood. We hope all of our listeners are doing well. I've seen a lot of conversation on Twitter and Facebook about using this as an opportunity to binge watch the entire series again. And people have sent us emails and and tweets saying, you know, the podcast has reignited my interest in watching this show again. And so I'm going to use this. I'm sitting on my couch and I'm starting with the pilot episode and I'm going all the way to goodbye, farewell and amen. So I think there are worse things to do, I guess, during a pandemic than, you know, binge watch every episode of MASH. That's very true. And, you know, um, I don't know if I was trying to make light of this awful thing. I'm not because it really is an awful thing. And the uh, tragedies that are going on around the world and locally are certainly nothing to make light of or laugh at. But it's just that we really do have to, for our own mental health, find some way of uh, creating some form of, of normalcy in our own home life. Yes. Because otherwise, it, you know, it can be pretty rough on us <laughs> psychologically. Yes. Uh, so we kind of <laughs> try to do something. Yeah. Uh, so we don't go nuts. Yeah. And doing things like binge watching and doing something that you really like to do, even cleaning the house, is something that's you know can be very healthy and and help us kind of get through this because. Boy, we need all the help we can get. I've I've actually tried to stop watching television as much as I did. I mean, it's hard not to hear the news and keep abreast of what's going on. Mm -hmm. But I've started to really pull back on it because it does get to be very, very oppressive. Mm -hmm. So I've tried to not do that and just kind of go back and listen to music or watch MASH or do something that's fun and feels good because that's I I think we really all need to do that. I agree. I agree. And no, we're not making light of it, but I think that you do have to find humor even in situations like this. And I think humor is a good way to help cope with this, which is something that, you know, we all learn from MASH is using humor to cope 
when there's not a lot of funny stuff happening in the world. And uh, right now, you know, yeah, it's it's not very funny out there. There's a lot of sick people and there's a lot of heroes taking care of sick people. Yeah. And we are appreciative of everybody who is making the effort to do what they can to, to make sure that this thing doesn't spread any further than it needs to spread. You see the similarities between the uh, uh, MASH crew who were trying to do something under tremendous pressure. And now here in 2020, it's real life and all the medical crew is trying to do something life-saving under tremendous pressure. So this is kind of a sort of a real life MASH kind of situation going on for all the medical people involved anyway. And that's why it's a perfect time to watch this series once again. And an even more perfect time to listen to MASH Matters podcast because (laughs) we have incredible guests on. Not only are we, you and I, incredibly charming and and adorable. (laughs) That's the (laughs) nicest thing anybody said to me today. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) But we also have an amazing array of personalities who end up sharing the microphones with us and coming on as guests, don't we? Yes, we do. In fact, we have one of those with us today, and we are tickled and thrilled to welcome Mr. Gary Berghoff to MASH Matters. Jeff, this was a great conversation we had with him. It really was. I look forward to listening to it again myself. Without further ado, here we go. Gary Berghoff on MASH Matters. Jeff and Ryan? Hello. Hey. Gary Berghoff. How are you, sirs? We're, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> we're fine. Uh, Ryan, Gary Berghoff, Gary Berghoff, Ryan Patrick. Hello, sir. So good to talk to you. Nice talking to you, sir. Thank you. Oh, Gary Berghoff, Jeff Maxwell, Jeff Maxwell, Gary Berghoff. Uh, I'm sorry, Jeff, Jeff who? Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> I've heard that before. I just had a five-hour energy, and it, it, it makes it hard for me to remember names. <laughs> I understand. (laughs) Well, Gary, welcome to MASH Matters. We appreciate you being here. MASH Matters was a an idea actually generated uh, from Ryan Patrick's brain, and uh, he said, "Hey, I'm going to do a uh, a MASH podcast. Would you be a guest on it?" And I said, "No, uh, but I'll do it with you." (laughs) (laughs) And uh, we started talking about it and thought it would be a fun idea. So MASH Matters was born, and it is created because Ryan is an ardent fan of the show and has been for many, many years. And I used to work there. So we thought that the uh, two perspectives would be kind of fun for folks to listen to, uh, where we could talk about the emotionalism uh, between, a, you know, having to do with a fan of MASH who grew up with it and a guy who used to work there and the emotionalism of that. So that's what MASH Matters is all about. Okay. All right. I think I understood that to begin with, but go ahead. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> there, there won't be any test then. You know what we're doing. All right. <laughs> First, we certainly want to say and, and express to you our, our deepest appreciation for taking the time to visit with us, because obviously I, I love and adore you and have for a million years, and I know all of our listeners do as well. So we really appreciate it. That, that's mutual, Jeff, and that's why I'm doing it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Now, what question could you possibly ask that hasn't been asked? You know, about that? <laughs> that's the truth. Well, okay, <laughs> let's start off with that, Gary. What is the the question that you most often get asked about MASH? Uh, I, I hate to tell you, but it's, do you really sleep with a teddy bear? <laughs> yeah. I, which is never really very intellectually uh, <laughs> uh, challenging, you know? Right, yeah, yeah. Because I've never met a teddy bear with a whole lot of intellectual capability. <laughs> Bet you'd want to be sleeping with, certainly, at least. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's true. I sleep with my Yorkie dog, Penny. Oh. Who's the dearest life form on Earth. You know, we talked a little bit earlier this morning about my, uh, my parrot, George, and I've had George for 35 years, and uh, she's really uh, part of my whole DNA, and uh, I can't imagine life without her and the world without her, really. She's just an amazing creature. And when you have these beautiful animals and you have that kind of relationship, it's thoroughly nurturing, and it's just a love that you, you don't get anywhere else, and it's an amazing thing. So I, I, I understand. Yes, it's an unconditional love. Can you tell me, uh, Jeff, remind me what kind of parrot you have? It's a double yellow head. That's technically what she's... Double? Yeah. Um, um, they call them Mexican double yellow heads? Yeah, she's... Uh, and the double yellow head... Uh... Does she have a paper? <laughs> <laughs> well, on the bottom of her cage, that's... <laughs> That's where her papers go. 
<laughs> very good. Thank you. Very good response. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's all I got. Thanks for coming, Terry. Good night. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of pets, I think I should let you know, Gary, that my dog's name is Walter. Mm. Oh, no kidding. No kidding. For any specific reason? Oh, uh, well, absolutely. <laughs> and it has everything to do with uh, Walter Eugene O'Reilly. My first dog, we named her Sophie oh. after uh, Colonel Potter's horse. Oh, how sweet. And then she passed away uh, a few years back back so oh. we, we went to the uh, and actually what's funny is we went to the shelter to pick out a dog and the name had already been given to Walter no kidding no kidding and that is what drew me uh, of course as a fan to that particular little mutt and uh, so Walter has found a home with us now and he's been our dog for I think going on three years now well, it sounds like the Walter has a very loving home. He does. I'm glad to hear it. He's not always appreciative of it, but yes, he does. <laughs> you, you know what my fantasy was when I was approaching my retirement years? It was to uh, retire on a large farm someplace, fairly remote, where I could rescue all the dogs that I could find. Mm -hmm. I ended up in an RV resort that has about 100 dog owners in it. Huh. which is the next best thing because we walk our dogs together uh, during the season here in Florida. Nice. Oh, that's cool. It, it really is. My uh, my youngest son told me once that I live in a bubble, and I told him, you bet I do, and it's a bubble of my choosing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dog bubble. Yes. A dog bubble. <laughs> there are worse bubbles to live in. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you could say that again. Yeah. Well, you, Gary, are an actor, director, accomplished, well-known painter. Uh, you're an author, musician. Let me just say this before I doze off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there is more glory in a single sunset than in all the combined triumphs of man. Mm. Glory to God. Mm -hmm. Those are the words that I've lived by since 1979. Mm -hmm. And I, I thank you very much for your respect uh, for all of those things that I am accredited to in my life. But uh, in the overall scheme of things, I don't take those things very seriously. I don't take myself very seriously. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. There was a time when I did, and that was, uh, you know, not a very happy time in my life. Hmm. Well, you also certainly created things for us all and you created them from your heart and soul, but they were also created for us, all of the, you know, the audience that got to watch you do that and to appreciate what you did. So, you know, wherever it comes from, you did it, and it came from your heart and soul, and that's what I think resonates and, and has so big an impact. on everyone. Thank you so much, uh, and I, I'm very touched by that. I believe it came through my heart. Yeah. Not from my heart. You know what I mean? I understand. Mm-hmm. Uh, Not only did you, you know, in terms of show business and iconic roles, what you did, you know, you brought to life Charlie Brown on stage and certainly another iconic figure in film and then later on television, Radar O'Reilly. So those are pretty cool things. They were all blessings. Yes. All of those roles. And not only that, but there were roles afterwards when I concentrated on doing theater for almost 20 years after I, I left MASH. They were all very special characters that express a certain aspect of humanity. Mm -hmm. They weren't just entertainment factor. And of course, the entertainment factor, let's talk about mass for a minute. The entertainment factor was extremely important. We had Larry Gelbart and Gene Reynolds, and needless to say, we had Alan Alda. And now, Alan had to be talked in to doing the show by Gene Reynolds after Gene Reynolds promised that MASH wouldn't just be uh, utilize the Korean War as a backdrop so we could make a lot of, a lot of jokes. Mm -hmm. It was about a real war, and it was, in a sense it was about all wars, which put the characters in a position where the only way they could cope with it was through their sense, partly through their sense of humor. And therefore, the uh, reality of the humor made sense without ignoring the fact that we were talking about a very real war, some very real pain, and some of the worst circumstances the human beings can ever experience. Mm -hmm. That's why I think MASH resounded with the public, because they believed that we were saying 
certain things that they were thinking and feeling. And at the same time, we were entertaining them, but not at the expense of the reality of war. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really think that Larry Gelbart and Gene Reynolds and Alan Alda were great blessings to us from the very beginning. Of course, the role of Radar started with the motion picture with Robert Altman. Yes. How did that happen where the, the same actor asked to play the same role in both the movie and carry that on into the series? What was what was the process like with the transition to TV? Uh, the, the process was I got a call from my agent. Who <laughs> <Okay. laughs> said, are you sitting down? And I said, no, do I have to? And he said, well... Uh, so 20th Century Fox and CBS want to make a television series based on the movie MASH. Oh, boy. Then I sat down. <laughs> because it, it was something, uh, uh, truthfully, that was unexpected. Uh, it's, it's hard to explain it now, but back then, uh, the movie MASH was so, in, in one respect, irreverent. Mm -hmm. uh, at least that's, that's the way some people described it, in part that nobody ever thought that a television series, which was basically back then, I dream of genie and bewitch, <laughs> could, could ever be, ever be made from it. Mm -hmm. And I was very skeptical, but when I heard the names, Alan Alda and Larry Galbart, uh, and their involvement, uh, you know, they had already been signed for it. I realized that, uh, that it was a, a distinct possibility that it could work. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but I was out of work, and I was eager to accept almost anything at that point, but I was very grateful that it was MASH that I was offered. Yeah. So you, but you had almost directly previous to that, you were on stage with, uh, with Charlie Brown, isn't that, you were, wasn't that about 19, 1967 in that era? Uh, time? Yeah, we, we, we started off-Broadway in 1967. And then I headed the uh, Los Angeles company in 69. In other words, I played it in New York for a year. And when they told me that they were starting a Los Angeles company, I asked them if I could head that task. And they, when I say headed, I mean play, recreate the role of Charlie Brown out there. Yeah. Because I wanted very much to be close to the film industry. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just give you a little background. While, in, while playing it in New York, in this tiny little 200 feet theater off Broadway, uh, we, were, we were getting some real Hollywood royalty coming to the theater, and we could, we could see them beyond the footlights, and one of them was Otto Preminger, the, the famous film director. Huh. And Otto uh, in, instructed his people to call me after the performance to arrange a meeting with him at his office in New York to discuss future film projects. Well, you know, for an actor who had struggled for so many years and was in a hit musical, hit play, to get a call from Otto Preminger was a big deal. Yeah, yeah. So I went to his office, and I sat there before his, his very well-appointed desk, and uh, <laughs> we, discussed, <laughs> we discussed several projects that he was working on. And I left the office an hour later feeling that I would definitely be called and uh, my motion picture career would begin. Nothing. <laughs> not a phone call, not a note, not a call to whatever agent represented me back then. Months and months and months went by. So my last hope was to head the Los Angeles company of Charlie Brown and see if I could get closer to the film industry. <laughs> About six months into the run, I get a call from whatever agent I had at that time, and he said, tomorrow I, I need for you to meet me at 20th Century Fox. There's a new movie uh, being done on the back lot, and uh, the producer is interested in you for it. And uh, it's called MASH. And I asked him, I don't understand. Is it about potatoes? What, what, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> Beer? What is it? Yeah. And, uh, and he said, no, it's, it has something to do with medics in a war circumstance. So I thought that was interesting. And I met him at uh, 20th Century Fox. And we went to a bungalow on the lot with a, the name Ingle Preminger on the door. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, Preminger, that sounds familiar, but I still didn't make the connection. <laughs> and remember, I'm a 25-year-old actor now, and I uh, had completely forgotten about Otto Preminger in my interview, 
and uh, I hear this voice beckon from within the office, come in, come in, please. Well, I go <laughs> in, and, and there's this salt-and-pepper-haired, uh, very congenial man who rose behind the desk and extended his hand, and I, we sat, and he talked about the weather and uh, congratulated me on my success in Charlie Brown, and it still didn't occur to me who I was talking to. <laughs> and then he said, oh, all right, that's enough. Get up. You go, please. <laughs> so I got up and I went. And as I went out the door, I turned briefly to look at his smiling face, <laughs> nodding head, uh, and uh, was completely bewildered at what this just was. It, it, it wasn't an in, a job interview. It, it, I didn't, you know... I, I had no idea what I had just encountered. <laughs> so I, I, I bid my agent goodbye, went home. When I got home uh, in the little house I was renting, the phone was ringing. And it was my agent. And he said, you got the part. Hmm. I said, I got what part? <laughs> he says, it's a character called Radar in the movie MASH, directed by Robert Altman. I didn't know who Robert Altman was. Hmm. I had never read a script. The script. Uh, it was sent to me very uh, that same day, and when I read it, I realized that this was something pretty special. And so that's how it began, and I was asked to create, uh, as I was asked to create the character of Charlie Brown uh, for the stage, I was asked to create Radar for the screen, and what a blessing that was. Yeah, no kidding. So working with uh, with Altman, there was so much, I mean, there's been so many uh, controversial things said about the process. And was it improv? Was it not improv? How much of it was, you know, did he, was he okay with that? Did he demand it? Well, I've got a story about that, but I, I want to just finish what I was saying. Like, you didn't interrupt me. I forgot to finish it. <laughs> my, my point was that Ingo Premerton was Otto Premerton's little brother. Oh! Otto had not forgotten me at all. He had recommended me to his brother Ingo for the film. Hmm. Wow. And a year later, that interview with Otto uh, came to flourish. Isn't that something? Now, as far as Robert Altman, yes, there was at living, but it was very methodical. Here's what happened. We have a wonderful script by Ring Lardner Jr. Very interesting script. In fact, he eventually was the only member of the company that won the Academy Award for Best Screenplay. The problem with that was there was very little of his dialogue left when the film was <laughs> edited together. Oh, because at one point when we were doing the scene in the swamp, the, the, the dialogue appeared to be stiff. It just didn't gel with Robert Altman's understanding because he, he was in the service. His understanding of how things actually were in the service, it was often very overlapping kind of dialogue uh, that, the service people were having and changing subject matter constantly because, you know, there's a certain chaos to a war or, or a military situation. Mm -hmm. And the actors very strongly sensed it. And I think it was Elliot and I, uh, Elliot Gould and I think uh, the other actors in the scene that agreed that if they could just paraphrase the material while still following the intent of the author and the intent of the scene, they thought that they could give a more spontaneous kind of performance. And Altman said, yes, let's do it. Mm. And then the whole production tended to take on that same chaotic tone. But it was, it was planned, and it was very artfully controlled by Altman. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was controlled chaos. Mm -hmm. A lot of writers today... Right, that there was chaos on the set. Well, it, it wasn't chaos. It was controlled chaos. It was on purpose. Hmm. Was it true that supposedly at one point Donald Sutherland tried to get him fired or they didn't want him on the picture? Is that, is that of any truth to it? That's what I've heard. But I, uh, and I do remember early on in the early shooting of the film, some enmity between Altman and Elliot and and Donald Sutherland, mm -hmm. but it ended very quickly mm -hmm. because I think they began to pick up on what Altman was getting at. Mm -hmm. So it may be possible that both things are true, that they may have complained early on, but uh, listen, they finished the project. Yeah. All of them finished the 
Yeah. And what did we get? You know, we got a, a, a true American original that was a modern day classic in its time. Yeah. And it's still uh, considered one of the great original American films. What a remarkable thing that uh, that Otto Preminger saw you. And then these events took place after that to lead to that moment uh, where Ingo Preminger is saying, yeah, you're the guy. You don't even know who the guy is. <laughs> <laughs> so many things like that happen in show business without, you know, it's not like, oh, you go audition for the part and then you get the part and then you do you either get it or you don't you go home but what an interesting series of events that led to that you also have to understand that it came after six years of me going to new york as a 19 year old practically teenager studying acting and struggling for six long years without work Mm. and then all of a sudden boom charlie brown lands in my lap and then Otto Preminger lands in my lap. Not, not that he ever sat in my lap. <laughs> I think he would have rejected that. Well, that's a whole different subject. You know, I don't want to go there. Yeah. We don't <laughs> but it was amazing. And, and it reinforced my later discovery that God doesn't give you what you want when you want it. Hmm. He gives you when you need it. Hmm. And that it was all a plan. It was all, you know, part of my fate as a human being, something that I was born to do and was being led to do, but it was being done in his way and not mine. Because when you tied it all together, it made perfect sense, but you could not in a million years imagine this happening when it was happening. Hindsight's twenty twenty. yeah. Yeah. You were born in in Connecticut, is that right? Bristol, Connecticut, 1943. And, you know, you kind of grew up and you were interested in, you've been an artist, I understand, for a long time. You've been painting uh, and you're a musician. What what drew you to, I mean, you could have gone in that direction or that direction, but what, what drew you to being an actor? Well, acting was always the first thing. Mm-hmm. Going back to when I was five, my mother, my mother was a very creative person. Uh, my father was a pragmatist, a businessman, and, and he was uh, attracted to this very creative dancer, who my mother was, uh, who, a dancer-writer. And she wrote musicals and productions for local charities, plays and, and musicals. And she would have pre-production rehearsals in our home. And as a little, you know, five-year-old kid, I was just taken away by the joy and the fun of it, and also the hard work that I saw these adults doing to prepare for these charitable uh, pieces that my mother was producing in Bristol, Connecticut. And one day she saw me in the music room of our house, lip syncing to a funny record. (laughs) I'm a lonely little petunia in an onion patch. (laughs) Could you do a little bit of that now, just for the heck of it? Just just give us a look. I'm a lonely little petunia in an onion patch, an onion patch. An onion patch. I'm a lonely little petunia in an onion patch. And all I do is cry all day. Boo, boo. <laughs> well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that's great. I, I was doing faces while you were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was doing faces too. Too. <laughs> and, uh, and she came to the door laughing, and she said, you're very funny. Let me give you some tips. And five minutes later, I was in show business. <laughs> she had a costume designed for me, and I was doing impersonations of famous people, you know, Ever Ever G. Robinson and Betty Davis. Wow. And before I knew it, I was performing, uh, you know, before the... Uh, Elks Lodge and the, the uh, institutions of mentally challenged. <laughs> and farmers out in the country would throw silver dollars on a picnic table as I performed. Wow. It was macabre looking back at it, and it was very amateur and very much fun. Mm-hmm, yeah. And I loved it. I loved it so much that it got to the point where I ran away from home in one place, <laughs> making my mother totally hysterical because I left a note explaining what I was doing that I was on my way to Hollywood. They found me five miles east of my home in Forestville, Connecticut curled up in a sewer pipe taking a a nap. (laughs) And my uncle who who delivered oil for a a living uh, discovered me and brought me home in his oil truck and uh, explained to me on the way home that I was heading in the wrong direction. I would have 
ended up in the Long Island Sound <laughs> in, instead of Hollywood. So I, I decided to go home with him to read a map. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but, but my poor mother had, was just on the verge of calling in the FBI. I mean, it was an awful... Oh, scary. The, yeah. the peanut butter sandwich that I had made wouldn't have lasted very long. <laughs> <In life. laughs> I, I remember as a kid, one of the things that kind of got my attention in terms of being funny and getting a little bit of attention, which was a really fun thing to do as a kid, was when we were watching, my parents and I were watching a, a show, a movie with uh, Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. And I got up and I imitated Jimmy Stewart. I was probably 11 or 9 or something. It probably didn't sound a lot like Jimmy Stewart, but they laughed. They just went, oh, wow. And they were laughing and laughing and laughing and thought, hey, this is cool. I like doing this. This is great. And it went in my head and never came out. And uh, it's an amazing. Yeah, what a child, you know, that imprint of that attention from the parents and having a fun time doing it and feeling really good about yourself. Boy, that lasted forever. There's something else, Jeff. I, I, I identify with everything you just said. Uh, when you get on a stage at a very young age and you see the imperfections in the society around you, you're taking it all in, you know, the dysfunctional quality, the sadness, the struggles, and, but you're able to make an entire audience laugh all at the same time. It reinforces what we all have in common, and it makes you feel safe as a little person. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you, you hunger for that all through your development. That's why I wanted to make films, because films can unite the human race in a certain kind of way. Yes. You know, if, if it's the right kind of film, you know, that's designed to do that, mm -hmm. uh, rather than some of these films that they make that, that just tear us down and tear us apart. Yeah. I was a big Frank Capra fan, mm -hmm. because his films always united the audience and brought us together during times of trouble. Yes. And not all with uh, fantasy, either. I mean, there was a lot of truth in Frank Capra's movies. Yeah. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life. Those films had a lot of truth mixed in with the fantasy. Mm -hmm. and, and they were very uplifting films. And you can say that you go on to star in a television series that really did a lot of the same things for the nation. The, the truth in the comedy and uh, how it really impacted people. Ultimately, it wasn't so much anti-war as it was pro Humanity. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, MASH had a pro-humanity message every single moment of every episode. And uh, it also had a pro-tolerance message. You know, tolerance for all the world's people. And in that respect, it was a great blessing to have been cast in a film like that because it, it, it allowed all of us to express what we felt inside of us. You know, can't we just get along? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? Which is, a, I think, a very important part in the hearts of, uh, of most people on earth, if not all of us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The transition from doing, from being radar in the movie uh, and being radar in the television show, there was a difference um, in radar that you brought to that character. Yeah, it wasn't a transition. It was an evolution because we had Larry Gelbart. Mm -hmm. What Larry would do so artfully was to, he even came to your home in the early part of development and get to know you personally. And then he would start marrying uh, what, what he saw in you into the character that he was writing for you. And little by little, Radar transformed into the more innocent and yet wise in a certain kind of wisdom, perhaps not the intellectual wisdom that is revered in society today, but a certain kind of instinctual wisdom, you know, from the mouth of babes. <laughs> yeah. That very much reflected the contrast between the more sophisticated characters on the show, the highly educated and so on. Right. And he made it possible for Radar Re to reflect certain horrors of war that the other characters perhaps would reflect intellectually. Uh, Radar would uh, re reflect it normally and emotionally and spontaneously. Uh, I'll give you. I'll give you a scene in point. Do you remember a scene? I think it was Welcome to Korea. I'm not sure what episode it was. But there was a Korean father who was having his daughters walk around the minefield to find out where the mines were. Yes, that was Welcome to Korea. Yes. Well, welcome to Korea. Okay. And one of the mines went off, and 
Radar and Hawkeye who were watching this in horror and trying to get, you know, the father to stop doing what he's doing, Radar just ran out in the, in the minefield mm -hmm. to help save the wounded Korean girl. Hawkeye didn't. Mm. That's the kind of writing that Larry Gelbart was doing for Radar and Hawkeye. Hawkeye was too intelligent to do it. <laughs> too, yeah, too smart to run out there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, but radar's, uh, radar's humanity was automatic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Overpowered the uh, whatever intellect <laughs> he may have had. Yeah, afterwards, when they were driving away to the hospital, Hawkeye was heard saying, that was very brave, Radar. And I said, what was? <laughs> He's just running out into the field like that. And I say, oh, yeah. Boy, that was brave. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, at any rate, that's, that was an example of what I was talking about. Yeah. I have a poster. At one point there, somebody did posters of mice. There were a few different versions. I got the, the very first one. It's a black and white poster of people hanging from the helicopter. One of my prized possessions, it, it, it resides in my hallway in my house. So everybody that has to go to the toity goes right by it. So <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I had everybody sign it, and uh, you signed something that I thought was really interesting. You said to Jeff, from one every man to another. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just, I loved that. I thought, wow, that's really cool. It was because, uh, partly because of what you had just said about your background and, you know, your first experience with laughter or, you know, bringing an audience together in the same tone, the same human experience, I, I think that you did have through your character and every man quality. Thank you. Yeah. And that is probably the greatest compliment I could share with a fellow actor. And it was, and I really, it, I cherish it to this moment. And I, I felt it when you wrote it, I went, Oh, I get it. And I really loved it. And I thank you again for doing it. Well, you're very welcome. People walk by and actually try and buy it from me. And I say, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, Really? I'll, how much are they offering? I'll sign a dozen phones. When, when, <laughs> when it gets up to 50 bucks, I'll, you know, I may sell. sell. We, we can print them. Forget it. <laughs> I'm not doing it for 50. Yeah. 62 50. <laughs> Maybe 62. <laughs> All right, that is part one of our conversation with the great Gary Berghoff. So much fun to hear him and uh, hear all these great stories about the early days of MASH. We're going to get into a lot more about MASH the series coming up in part two. Uh, part two, you're going to hear about his memories from the early days on the set and the genius of Larry Gelbart and Gene Reynolds. And he's going to talk about getting shot by Private Igor. <laughs> <laughs> it was nothing personal. They wrote it in the script, so <laughs> right. it wasn't my idea. Gary. And and he is going to talk about why he left MASH as well. So that'll be coming up in part two of our conversation with Gary Berghoff. It was so much fun to talk with him. It's just an amazing thing for me to talk to everybody. And it, just hearing their voice really takes me back 100 million years, right, to the set mm -hmm. and to the uh, to the feelings that, that we all had. So it's a really wonderful experience uh, for me to do that. And I hope everybody else enjoys it, uh, meaning <laughs> Gary Berghoff and all the other wonderful actors we've interviewed so and gary is a one you know I, I i don't know we talk too much about it but he's a wonderful painter he is truly a wonderful painter mm -hmm. he did my house and i know that he has a really good price uh if you're interested he'll probably do a number of people we can put that up on the website so gary i'm going to help you out here <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. He's a terrific artist, watercolor artist. He does wonderful paintings of uh, animals, birds, and, and landscape. He's just, he's really amazing. I, he's ama hes an amazing person. I love him dearly. He is. He is. And you can uh, find a link in our show notes at mashmatterspodcast.com for this episode. We're going to put a link in there where you can see some of his paintings. And there's also a link there where you can purchase a copy of his book. We really didn't talk about his book, which is an autobiography biography that he wrote a few years back titled Gary Berghoff to mash and back my life and poems and songs that nobody ever wanted to publish. And uh, you can find the link there in the show notes and you can purchase his book. Hey, we're looking forward to part two, which will be coming up very soon. 
If you would like to give us feedback on this episode, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to us through our website, mashmatterspodcast.com. You can find us on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, and uh, please subscribe to us as well. You know, you can find us on all of your favorite podcast players. And if you like, you can leave us a five-star review there on Apple Podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can uh, call and leave a voicemail at 513-436-4077. And if you want to see what color... Gary painted the house. Just let us know and I'll be happy to send you a little picture. <laughs> send you some, some paint samples. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So until next time, here's looking up your old address. Mm-hmm.